President Buhari directs relevant agencies to enforce safety footholds for water transportation across the country. NDLEA destroys 15 hectare cannabis farm in Ogun State. They will always lose. So they continue, uh, we're after them. Destroyed goods worth millions of naira in building at the local market in Lagos. From Good Morning Nigeria today, we shall discuss the 2023 appropriation bill of the federal government. A budget proposal of 20.51 trillion naira for the year 2023 was laid Friday before the National Assembly by President Muhammadu Buhari. Now that happened to be the eighth and last budget presentation as he may he is going to make as president to the National Assembly. Of course, Jumai, and that implies that uh, later on next year we shall be having a new president who will present the budget proposals before the National Assembly. However. One legacy of President Muhammad Buhari, for whoever his uh, successor will be, is returning the budget to the January to December cycle. And this, of course, uh, has happened consistently in recent years. Indeed, Kinsley and economic experts consider the return to the January-December budget cycle as a remarkable feat by the Buhari administration, especially as it gives everyone the propensity and leverage for financial planning and thanks to cordial relationship between the legislature and executive within the last three years. Well, that's right, uh, uh, Jumai. Now, although uh, that cordiality has sometimes been construed as uh, the National Assembly being a rubber stamp, and uh, this view has uh, been expressed in some quarters, but others argue that it has turned out to be of uh, national advantage. Uh, this is because Usually, the kind of contactless relationship between the legislature and the executive uh, branches of, of government over the appropriation bill, those contactless relationships have been smoothed to a considerable extent. Now, the 2023 appropriation bill of, of 20.51 trillion naira has been christened in the budget of fiscal consolidation and transition, and it reflects an increase of. Um, 390 billion naira from uh, the 19.76 trillion projected in the 2023-2025 medium-term expenditure framework and fiscal strategy paper, which both chambers of the National Assembly have already passed. Now, the budget size is about 3 trillion naira higher than that of uh, the outgoing year, 2022. Indeed, Kinsley, based on their relationship, it's like they gave each other a tap on the back on that day, you know, working out a cordial relationship that would help in transiting Nigeria from this government to the other. And out of the 20.51 trillion Naira, 8.27 trillion was proposed as non-debt recurrent cost. 6.31 trillion was earmarked for debt through servicing and 5.35 trillion for capital expenditure, including the capital component of statutory transfers, while 4.99 trillion was earmarked for personal cost well the 2023 budget proposal is predicated on an oil price benchmark of 70 dollars per barrel and daily oil production estimates of about 1.69 million barrels per day now we also have an exchange rate of 435 naira uh, 57 couple per us dollar and the projected gdp growth of 3.75%, as well as an inflation rate of 17.16%. Now, 1.1 1 .1 trillion naira is for overheads, and uh, over 700 billion naira has been earmarked for statutory transfers, with a sinking fund of uh, nearly 250 billion naira earmarked to uh, retire certain maturing bonds. 
Now, President Buhari said the expenditure policy of the government in the year 2023 was designed to achieve the strategic objectives of the National Development Plan 2021 to 2025, such as my microeconomic stability, human development, food security, improved business environment, energy sufficiency, improving transport infrastructure, and promoting industrialization. The president, however, cautioned uh, relevant committees of the uh, National Assembly to desist from passing budgets for government-owned enterprises, uh, which he says are usually at variance with the budgets he has sanctioned. Now, this, according to the president, is against the rules and must stop. Well, he also cautioned against budget pardon, which was a college that became popular after the first budget presentation of this administration several years back. The president says he wouldn't be happy if there are insertions to the budget proposals when the bill is returned to him. But is that possible, Kesley? Well, that's a big question. We've had uh, debates over this uh, over the years, especially with the Fourth Republic as to the exact role of the National Assembly. Some argue that their role uh, certainly is not merely to receive the budgetary proposals or the appropriation proposals, but to interrogate it yeah. and then uh, not just be a mayor about stuff to say we approve what you have done. Uh, so these are some of the issues that um, have often come up. We have seen budgets slightly higher or manifestly uh, more than what the executive arm of government had earlier proposed. Now, there's hardly any time the overall budget proposal is slashed to less than what the executive arm uh, envisages. But with the presentation of the 2023 appropriation bill by President Muhammad Dubois, it's now up to the National Assembly to because consider the various estimates and then the Nigerians will await what the final outcome would be. That's our focus on our conversation segment on Good Morning Nigeria today. Welcome to the program. I'm Kingsley Osadolo. And I am Jim Mayusu. We have our complimentary segments. We have guests who will interrogate this topic and give us you know, a, a possible way to understand the budget. Happy Eid al holiday to you out there. But right now we have Comfort in the studio with our morning news. Hello, Comfort. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, Jume and Kingsley. Good morning, Nigerians. President Mahmoud Buhari has directed relevant agencies of government to check and enforce the safety protocols of ferries to ensure accidents are avoided in the future. The president said this while expressing sadness over the boat accident in Anambra State, in which dozens of people were killed. The boat reportedly carrying 85 persons capsized following rising floods in a viral area of the state, with a death toll of 76 persons. Following the tragedy, the Nigerian Inland Waterways Authority, NIWA, and the National Emergency Management Agency have embarked on rescue and recovery missions. And as efforts are being made to resolve the dilemma of travelers along the Lokoja, Koton Kalfi, Abuja Highway, boat transportation is the only way out for stranded commuters on this axis, even though many travelers have phobia for water. Before we know they go Koto, but now we don't they enter Koto. If you don't carry from KRC here, Anybody will carry from KRC and I'll go to direct. It's more expensive than normally we do enter 2,000 naira, but now we spend up to 5,000 to, to be able to, to cross to reach Lokoja to Koto before we cannot take moto to Abuja. The Abuja to Kaduna train service suspended for about seven months due to terrorist attacks will resume operations soon. Minister of Transportation Mazu Jaji Sambo gave the indication after the release of the remaining 23 kidnapped victims. While briefing the media in Abuja, the minister st stated that no ransom was paid for their release. I'm going to resume very soon. So we have a short term and a long term plan. The short term measures will be put in place very, very quickly to enable rail services commence. And Beyond a period of three months, we will have put in place a sustainable plan that will ensure that our rail, uh, rail lines are safe and secure. 
operatives of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA Ogun State Command, have arrested 21 suspects and destroyed 15 hectares of cannabis farm worth millions of naira at Imaba area, J3 in Ijebu East, local government area of Ogun State. The farm was discovered through intelligence gathering by the command. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, loss. So, so long as NDL is following them, they continue to lose their economy. We waited till this time for them to know that what they're doing is not right. In goods, what millions of naira have been destroyed by fire in a building on Martin Street, Balogun Markets in Lagos on Sunday. It was reported that the fire raged for several hours before it was put under control by firefighters and other emergency responders. The good thing there is that there is no casualty. The, the terrain is very, very difficult. There are a lot of things that have impeded the access of the fire service that are trying to put out the fire. Aligned with the directive of the Inspector General Police for Manhunt of Escapees of the Kujie Correctional Center, Kano State Command of the Nadron Police Force has arrested one of the escapees, Abakar Muhammad Sadiq, who has since been handed over to the Nadron Correctional Service Kano for onward return to the Kujie Correctional Facility. The suspect confessed that he was among those that escaped from the local custody at Kuje Correctional Center. We, this, we must use this medium to appreciate and thank the good people of Kano State. Bokamano Sadiq is now in our custody and uh, all necessary arrangements have been making to repatriate him back to his original habitat, that is medium school to custodial center, Kuje. Away from that, President Muhammad Buhari will on Monday, October 10th, attend the investiture ceremony of Muhammad Idris Debi Itno as president of the transitional team in Republic of Chad for two years. The function which will hold at the capital of N'Djamena will, will further accentuate negotiations, negotiations on peaceful and harmonious return to democratic process in the country following the passing of the former president, Idris Deby, in April 2021. President Buhari will return to Nigeria after the function. That's the news for now. Good morning, Nigeria continues with Jume and Kinsley after this break. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the NTA. Next on the program is Business News with Comfort Amudu. Beginning to galvanize and cultivate the base of the export pyramid. There has been an appreciable growth and development in Nigeria's non oil export, with the strategic push by the Nigerian Export Promotion Council to transform the sector. However, there is a snag. It is the high rate of export rejects of some agricultural produce from Nigeria in the international markets due to quality requirements and certification from accredited authorities, especially with small and medium enterprises. But the cherry news is, all that is changing. We were not where we used to be entirely. We've gotten better. Production has expanded. Now we have certification. Recently, I received a demand which they said, anything we can produce, I mean, we have, they will buy it off, like the black sesame to them. And the demand is growing. So we should just work on modalities like policies and softening hands on some of uh, the bottlenecks. The initiative to increase financing for exporters in Nigeria through key financial institutions in the country is geared towards enhancing the financial base for MSMEs and exporters to promote non oil export long term. <laughs> Thank you very much, Comfort and Model, for the business package. And good morning, Nigeria. Up next is newspaper review. Well, I have 
have a few papers here to read out and analyze for you this morning and I'll begin with the Daily Trust newspaper and just below the mass head we have 2023 PDP flags of presidential campaign in Oyo today. You find details on page 28. Obajana standoff Dangote to approach court as Kogi moves to recover company. You find the details on page 19. An umbrella boat accident, 16 bodies recovered as per Nambuhari orders rescue operations. Find details on page 5. And um, at the side piece of the illustration you see there, NMPP will defeat APC PDP in presidential poll as coming from the presidential candidate of the NMPP, Rabi Musa Konko. So you find details on page 28. Non disclosure of lifted crude. Court freezes three oil and gas firms' account. Details on page 21. How flood submerged Olam's 4,400 4, hectares of rice in Nasarawa State. Details on page 25. And uh, we see the picture illustration of indicating how 62 airlines went moribund since 1960 with Ryder. Multiple charges, harsh business environment responsible as coming from the operators and the need for alternative funding. Kinsley. All right. Uh, we also have uh, the Daily Sun newspaper. The Daily Sun newspaper, let's uh, go straight to the lead story, which is on politics, and it has a kicker. 2023 presidency. Dugara, Babache, and Muslim leaders adopt consensus candidate. Uh, that's the lead story for the Daily Sun newspaper. Idel Maloud, Gwanye, Samuel Lu, Umahi, above Benin, and others felicitate with Muslims. Uh, that's on page 26. Navdak warns against four deadly cough syrups in circulation. Uh, dead clergy's wife, two children, and two sisters found dead in Enugu. And we will agog as article flags of campaigns amid reconciliation with Wiki and allies. NDLA intercepts 2.4 million uh, tramadol at Lagos Airport. And the second list story is also on politics. APC to release amended campaign council list this week. Uh, PCC demands NWC's financial support for Tinubu. PCC stands for Presidential Campaign Council. And then Kogi students and Dangote shareholders differ on developments at Obajana uh, cement factory. You have details of that story on page uh, 26. So those are the headlines that we have this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mind? Yeah, those are the headlines we have this morning. One particular in thing of interest in the paper you just read is the the drug, the cough syrup that you know most people buy and use as drugs actually take it sleep throughout the day and i think government is really really trying trying to cap you know the infiltration of this harmful cough syrups to nigeria and our youth going gaga on it what do you think well this is uh, there was a time uh, and i think we had at least multiple conversations on that on good morning nigeria which had to do with the abuse of cough syrups uh those were legitimate legal clean cough syrups but it's just that it was being abused especially the cough syrup with the codeine base mm. uh, and kano uh, was said to be the if you like the headquarters of the consumption of uh, cough syrups. At some point, it was reported when we had the conversation on Good Morning Nigeria that uh, they, they were abusing about up to a million bottles of cough syrups a day in Kano. Mm -hmm. But this is not the same as drug abuse. This has to do with tainted or contaminated uh, cough syrups for children. Mm -hmm. uh, and the story is, of course, coming out of the Gambia, where a writer to uh, the headline uh, on page 3 says that 63 children are dead already. Uh, from uh, the uh, cough syrups. Now the cough syrups are said to come from uh, from uh, from India, I believe, and the names of the cough syrups are stated there. Uh, 
Small is oral solution, back of maxaline and Markov baby cough syrup and Margrip and cold syrup. So for those, of course, it's, it's a useful advice. I would think that this kind of publication or kind of stories should be sustained. Mm. And, and, and warnings, of course, uh, placed on the front pages of newspapers uh, as well as online uh, online uh, media outlets yes. so that parents are appropriately advised and even warned and uh, not to touch any of these capsules. And Nigerians who are uh, used to importing any and everything from all corners of the globe exactly. uh, should they themselves also now be advised as to the toxic cough syrup that is now in the market. As already killed, we understand 63 children in the Gambia, and to be forewarned is to be forearmed, and yes. every man ordinarily ought therefore uh, to be careful. I recall some years ago, mm. uh, we had it's some uh, infant solution as well. It was called my Pekin. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember. My Pekin caused quite some uh, devastating yeah. uh, consequence uh, in children. Lagos, even around the Lagos area. Mm -hmm. And I think there was some prosecution uh, around that. So that 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 is a useful advice we're coming from now. That mm. you have deadly uh, uh, baby cough syrups in in, in the Gambia, mm. and uh, we do not know whether those syrups. Uh, will find their way or could find their way already in the Nigerian market. Uh, but uh, whoever uh, cites any of those cough syrups, the names are listed on page three according to the statement issued uh, by uh, by NAVDAC uh, that uh, you, you should be uh, adequately uh, advised. Uh, some of the signs of uh, of the uh, of the toxic effects mm, uh, of mm. the, the syrups are, are follows. I just take them according to the paper here. Abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, inability to pass urine, headache, altered mental state, and ac acute kidney injury, uh, which may lead to death. So the symptoms, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, inability to pass urine, um, headache and altered mental state and acute kidney injury. That's quite alarming actually. It's absolutely. And coming for, from children who cannot speak at times mm -hmm. and generally what's really going on with them. It's a pediatric alarm. There's mm -hmm. no question about it. And, yeah. and I think parents, you know, healthcare workers, uh, pharmacists mm -hmm. uh, and all that, they should uh, of course be on the lookout for, for all of this. There's also the related story of Another set of tramadol uh, drugs yeah. being seized uh, in, in, in Lagos. They said inter, uh, NDLEA uh, intercepts 2.4 million tramadol at Lagos Airport. I think it was at the last week or the week before, yeah. there was also a story of uh, some millions of tablets of tram tramadol, tramadol yes. being seized <clears throat> at uh, what was described as uh, a mansion. It didn't look like a mansion anyway. It probably looked like a block of flats. Uh, somewhere at VGC, that's Victoria mm -hmm. Garden City, mm -hmm. uh, the Lucky Peninsula. That, uh, you just have to ask yourself this question. And you keep hearing millions of, of tramadol uh, tablets, millions of this, millions of that. Well, just, just what is the business of this, of the importance of, of these items? Is, is Nigeria a wash in drugs or is the drug demand so high in the country it that is. you at some no, I'm just, I'm, this is a rhetorical question I'm asking because we've had conversations around the drug demand reduction as one of the ways of dealing with the issues that you keep having two point something million and you don't got 2.4 million. I, I don't know how a tramadol tablet looks like, or how many somebody needs to take to be high, or how many you need to take to continue to be. Uh, really, tramadol you know? is it's 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 a, uh, it's a it's a medicine for bone problem. If you have bone problem, you're, it's prescribed in the hospital. But when you take too much, you end up spending the whole day sleeping and uh, just being drugged up. I, but I think Nigeria too, it's it's like it's like a, a passage. For these drugs to pass to other country, neighboring countries, Nigeria, but it's quite alarming. The more they arrest, the more they bring it in. Uh, absolutely. And this, this one is tramadol is different from umpiri miri, I believe. <laughs> umpiri miri is the ice, the one that is ice. They <laughs> take that, I, I, we, had a, we had a discussion around that also on Good Morning Nigeria sometime at the point. Yes. And they take it and the, 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 the abusers just go gaga. They just yes. go gaga. I, I, I think when they when they enjoy being it in a, in a state of drunkenness throughout so the day. Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, it's kudos to the NDA that they keep mm -hmm. making these arrests and then, of course, destroying uh, the drugs as 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 they get there. But as we also advised, uh, they have to be more scientific ways of of incinerating these drugs. I started the other day that it was Madabo and I, of course, who were on set when we were. Uh, discussing the drugs that they seized and then they made a bonfire of it mm. with tires, 
polluting the environment. Yeah, you the environment you, you, have, you, you can, you, there, is a, there are still plants around Lagos, for instance, uh, where you can use a furnace. Mm. Uh, you use a furnace to. Uh, That's what how it's done in developed uh, countries. To incinerate it, and then of course uh, get the person. But more importantly, the, those who are behind it take them in and put them behind bars. And I'm sure that over the weekend, Nigerians, uh, who of course are on the, uh, on the social media, uh, would have received a number of videos mm. uh, relating to the uh, discoveries as to how Nigeria's crude oil has been siphoned over the past nine years. You had the illegal pipelines Pipeline. leading directly uh, uh, to, uh, to to the sea. And this is a big story. Okay. And it's something, of course, that we have to focus on. But one thing, one comment to make almost immediately. And, and this is something that we also ought to ask okay. ourselves as a country. Why do we do this to, to ourselves? ourselves? Why do we do this to ourselves? Now, because when you look at, when you look at the consequence, a few criminal elements might say, oh, they are in business, X, Y, Z, and they are making their profit and taking the money offshore. But look at the consequence. Environmental degradation. Environmental, that's, that's fine. But let's even look at the monetary returns. Mm. The country is shortchanged. We don't have enough, uh, enough, uh, enough foreign reserves. Uh, and when there is pressure on the foreign reserves, you have pressure also uh, on the value of the matter. And inflationary pressure also comes on. The government is struggling, looking for resources to finance a wide variety of projects. Government are going uh, in. In the meantime, you just have these criminal elements uh, for nine years uh, mm. taking away uh, our resources. There is probably, I imagine, no country in the world that is as wantonly ripped like uh, Nigeria. and by its own citizens mm -hmm. in collusion with foreigners. And I think that there ought to be some very harsh lessons taught from uh, the incidents of this nature. When, when you look at those videos, you watch them from beginning to end. I mean, some comments were being made when uh, Tompulu was awarded the contract. Yes. Oh, they said, well, no. this is why, uh, you know, sometimes it, before one gets into commentaries on issues it is useful to have an understanding of the facts yeah. you don't know who is driving the argument against Tompolo exactly. but it's a big fine it you is. know by Tompolo and and, uh, and 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 his company and and, and his associate so uh, that's a huge story and mm. as I said I mean it's something that will engage uh, our attention the other story you read Jumai mm. which is a lead uh, we're going to have to start the newspaper review shortly mm. which is a lead on uh, on the daily trust the number I of airlines airlines says how 62 airlines went more bonds since 1960 that is to say in 62 years, I mean, you've had one airline uh, going bust. We do know that, of course, the uh, first private uh, airline in Nigeria arrived before Nigeria's independence, yeah. and that's aero contractors. Uh, and then the first uh, scheduled uh, private airline flight, commercial flight, was Okada. Mm -hmm. Okada yeah, came, yeah. And which is where he got the name uh, from. But one of the major problems that have been cited there, including that, has to do with corporate governance. Yes, multiple charges, hard but, business. No, 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 multiple charges, good and regulatory. Yes, we're corporate yes. governance. Mm. In the, most of these airlines were set up as virtually one-man businesses. Mm. And, and you can't, the airline business, unless you are running a small charter service, if you want to be in regular scheduled commercial uh, operations, uh, your corporate governance must be right. In other words, you also must be able to admit of other shareholders, mm. not to say, Jumai, oh, you own your airline, Kingsley uh, Aviation Limited, okay. Jumai uh, Executive Services, mm. and so on and so forth. So, okay. I think that that's one lesson that we haven't learned. We have not essentially imbibed the spirit of corporatization mm. uh, in our airline operation. You still see them around. Some of them are struggling here and there, and then the owner, mm. the owner will direct which flight will go somewhere, another one will direct which one will not go somewhere. So you don't make the right business decisions. And exactly. therefore, uh, for, uh, an airline, uh, for an airline business that is very competitive uh, and, of course, very costly and highly regulated. And folds up a lot very of the uh, and uh, lost uh, there. Well, uh, 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 that's the people. Although we should also yeah, note, yeah. though, that ADC, Aviation Development Company, mm. was a good airline. Well, and we were ruined, of course, by the crash of 1996. Well, we're going to float our own carrier very soon. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm watching that business. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll take a break right now when we return our conversation. We'll begin. Do stay. Yeah, welcome back. And as a prompt for our conversation, which is on the 2023 Appropriation Bill, here's a background report by State House Correspondent Adam Osambo.
It was not only historic, but simply an emotional sight to behold as President Muhammad Buhari laid the 2023 Appropriations Bill before a joint session of the National Assembly for the last time as Commander-in-Chief and Leader of Democratic Nigeria. The 2023 budget, amongst others, reflects the serious challenges facing Nigeria, key reforms necessary towards addressing them, and the imperatives to achieving higher, more inclusive, diversified, and sustained growth. The 20.51 trillion Nara budget is therefore made up of 5.35 trillion Nara capital expenditure, 8.27 trillion Nara non debt recurrent cost. 4.99 trillion naira personnel cost, 6.31 trillion naira debt service, 1.11 trillion naira overhead cost, and 744.1 billion naira statutory transfers. And in line with the approved 2023 to 2025 medium term expenditure framework and fiscal strategy paper, the budget is predicated on an oil price benchmark of $70 per barrel, daily oil production estimate of 1.69 million barrels per day, exchange rate of 435 naira 57 kobo per dollar, a projected GDP growth rate of 3.75% as well as inflation rate of 17.16%. I would like to implore the leadership of the National Assembly to ensure that the budget I made here today, which includes those of the government-owned enterprise, be returned to the presidency when passed. The current practice where some committees of the National Assembly purport to pass budgets for government-owned enterprises, which are at variance with the budgets sanction by me and communicate such directly to the MDAs is again going and need stop peace. Noting with dismay the crisis that has paralyzed activities in Nigeria's public universities, the president said he expressed from the staff better appreciation of the current state of affairs in the country. In the determined effort to resolve the issue, we have provided a total of 400 and 70 billion naira in the 2023 budget from our constrained resources for revitalization and salary enhancements in the tertiary institutions. President Buhari also promised sustained efforts at boosting food production and distribution towards bringing down the high food prices, positioning the manufacturing sector to generate more foreign exchange, as well as securing lives property and investments across Nigeria. The 2023 budget proposal, the president said, is a product of interagency collaboration, extensive stakeholder consultations, and productive engagements. He therefore appreciated the media, the organized private sector, civil society organizations, and the nation's development partners for their contributions. And to discuss the topic, let me introduce first here in the Abuja studio, Professor Uchi Owalaki, a regular on Gumo in Nigeria. He's a professor of capital market at the Nassau State University, Kefi, and president of capital market academics in Nigeria. It's a pleasure to have you join us. Yeah, thank you, Jumai. Uh, good morning, Nigeria. Happy Idel Malud. Thank you so much. And from our Benin studio, we have been joined by Professor Mike Obada. He is the Professor of Economics and member CBN Monetary Policy Committee. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Jumai. It's my great pleasure to be with you this morning. Good morning, Nigeria. All right, Prof. Michael Bado, thank you. And uh, also from our Kaduna Network uh, Center, we have another uh, regular guest on the program. That's Shwaibu Idris. As uh, Managing Director and CEO of Timeline Consults. Uh, so I would we're glad to have you this morning. Kesley, good morning and good morning Nigerians. Let me seize the opportunity to wish all of us a happy independence anniversary and even my lord to our Muslim brothers. And uh, from our uh, 
Zoom connection in uh, Enugu. We also have another regular on the program. That's Professor Kenefe. Uh, he's an economic policy analyst. Professor Kenefe, we're glad to have you. Thank you for having me. Good morning, Nigeria. Uh, happy Salah. All right. Uh, well, gentlemen, uh, it's once again, it's our delight to uh, have you uh, at least uh, take off from uh, the holiday season uh, to be our guests on uh, Good Morning Nigeria today. And before we begin to interrogate uh, relevant aspects of the 2023 appropriation uh, bill, uh, let me just ask this question. Do we ever take time off to assess uh, any preceding budget? so as to know what we are getting into uh, in the uh, following year. In other words, for instance, uh, have we had any assessment of the 2022 Appropriation Act? Uh, before the 2022 Appropriation Act, did we have any evaluation of 2021 Appropriation Act? And if so, uh, what should be the guideposts uh, before we start dwelling on uh, a, a new deal altogether? Let's begin with... Uh, uh, the future we're looking right here in our studios. Prof. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ken Sullivan, again. Uh, I, I think we do. Um, even the Fiscal Responsibility Act <coughs> makes provision for that. Uh, it says that um, the budget implementation reports ought to be out <coughs> 30 days after the end of each quarter, that there should be a quarterly um, release of uh, implementation reports. But of course, <coughs> that would appear to be unrealistic. Um, and what we you know, tend to find is that um, they are usually in areas. Um, as we speak, if, we, if you go to the website of the Budget Office, what you find is this, the uh, second quarter of 2022 implementation report. So we, we've had that of first quarter and second quarter. And if you also look at listening to the budget speech, it's also on the base of that that the, the president started by reviewing the 2022 uh, uh, you know, the budget performance. Uh, of course, where he talked about the revenue challenges. For example, the, the president said that between January and um, July, that the uh, government revenue was um, only met only 63 percent of uh, prorated, you know, t t uh, targets. Okay. So, uh, and that he also said that between that period, uh, we have uh, paid as much as 1.59 uh, trillion, you know, by way of. Um, um, or a subsidy. Uh, he also talked about the capital spend, spend, what has been allocated to NDAs by way of capital expenditure, I think about 1.4 uh, trillion over the same period. So to answer your question, Kinsley, yes, um, there is usually a review of um, the performance of the uh, current year's budget because that is what now leads um, you know, the government into uh, preparing or the, that of the the next um, budget for the next year. So a review is usually done. Well, well thanks. I, I, mean, I, I know that you, you cannot have a review uh, almost immediately at the end of a quarter. That's why I said it. But this is, yeah. this is usually uh, you know, in areas. And, and the issue then is the inputs into the review. Mm. Uh, who does the review? And that's why I, I would like uh, Professor Michael Badan uh, himself to also weigh in on this. Uh, Professor Michael Badan, uh, how useful is our uh, is a review of budget performance of an outgoing year uh, as therefore as an, ad an advisory uh, for the uh, incoming appropriation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kinsley. I think normally such reviews ought to be very useful, uh, both for the information of the public and also as a input into public policy making in relation to the, a new budget that is being formulated. But like uh, Professor Uwaleke has uh, rightly pointed out, and uh, you Kisley also confirmed, uh, most of the time, the reports from the you know, budget office of the Federation or the ministry entirely uh, tend to be in arrears, and uh, very importantly, you know, uh, not many people, you know, get to know of the reviews. Uh, perhaps, you know, it's put on the internet, and I know hard copies used to be, you know, produced, 
but the distribution is very limited. And so, yes, such uh, reviews, you know, are available to government, government officials for the purpose of formulating a new budget or even as inputs into the pres Mr. President's uh, budget statement. But most of the time, you know, uh, may, very many Nigerians are not aware of such a report. Uh, perhaps during the, you know, early inputs into a new budget formulation, uh, the stakeholders uh, invited, you know, to contribute to such uh, discussions, you know, probably have, you know, access to those reports. You know, uh, I myself have not seen any copy this year, maybe because you know, I didn't seem to show interest. If I want a problem, I will check the internet and find one. But I will, uh, you know, advise that going forward, the Ministry of uh, Finance, Budget, you know, National Planning should endeavor to devise ways to make such reports, budget review reports, widely available, you know, to the generality of the public. Thank you, Professor Ibarra. Let, let me join Shabu Idris now in Kaduna. We, we, we are opening the, co the conversation with you know, the review of preceding budget and how it can you know, help in the incoming budget that, is, that was presented by President Mohamed Bari. Some say it is not timely enough and some say that it should be open to public uh, purview. But don't you think that the public itself are really not interested in knowing how the budget goes? Yeah, uh, Jimmy. Uh, once again, good morning. I think uh, the issue is not whether the public are interested uh, or not. The issue, simply put, is how is the analysis uh, done on the implementation or otherwise of a previous budget. Uh, in accounting parlance, we have what we call variance analysis. Uh, variance analysis. Uh, is done to interrogate with a view to interrogating what were the assumptions underlining uh, a budget or a program. What did we set out to achieve? What did we achieve? How were we able to achieve what we achieved? And if there are negative variances, why were there those negative variances? What were the factors that made us not to achieve our target. Uh, in the case of, for example, 2021 budget, Mr. President, this year we set out to achieve X amount of revenue, and what we got was 63%. Mr. President kept quiet there. What we expected in terms of the variance analysis, in terms of re review of uh, the, 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 the budget, was what went wrong. Uh, were the assumptions by the budget office wrong? And if they were, why were they wrong? Did we, did, didn't we perceive something? Was there a hurricane? Were there, was there a natural uh, disaster like the, the lawyers will say a force major? Those are the kind of analyses that uh, should underpin you know, uh, historical performance. Uh, generally, this country... Until very recently, we've not had an M and E, a monitoring and evaluation unit on projects uh, in government. Uh, recently, there is a bit of uh, an attempt uh, to have that unit so that we review each and every uh, project. I think it is important that yes, uh, annually we should be interrogating uh, underlying assumptions what were the inputs, what were the output, and what uh, are the impact of such output, and are we achieving our target or not? What do we need to change? Uh, I believe if we don't do so, we will not be able to be building a future for a better uh, country that we hope to all live in. So, Abidus, thank you very much there also for your comment. Uh, let's hear from Professor Kenneth. Professor Kanife, how well are we utilizing our uh, rigorous review of the preceding year's uh, budget to inform what we then intend to do going forward? Well, you know, the, first of all, our 50% score 
you couldn't say anything worse than it's, it's done. It's done what it could. It's at fifty percent. That's that's what it should. Fifty percent of the year, fifty percent of the budget spent. But bear in mind that last year's budget, twenty twenty one, was extended to March and further extended to June. So all those expenditures were, especially the capital capital side, we are all continued to be expended up until June. And then now this was also twenty twenty two was concurrent. So it could have been higher. But having said that, if you decompose the that expenditure, you will see that um, first of all we have not on our uh, budget deficit was still somewhere around sixty three percent. So we still have a longer way to go on what they bringing down the budget deficits. But on the in, in, if you look at the disaggregation between capital, the balance of capital and recurrent, you will see that there is always hundred percent on the current because priorities are pay salaries hundred percent, pay pension hundred percent, make sure security gets what they want. So by the time you come on very near the pecking order is capital expenditure. So you can see that capital expenditure doesn't always uh, keep pace with all the other expenditure. That's why it's, it's bring, it only it releases at the only one point four eight trillion. So even as you come to December you will still find 100% expenditure on all those recurrent items and debt service items. But then capital is what is always lagging behind. And that's why you keep getting extension to March of the next year and extension possibly to June. So I think uh, on balance, it is, it, they've done what they could. And then um, we could see a much better performance going forward. Yeah, I'm going to stay with you briefly. The, the budget is coming at a time of local and global challenges, and uh, but still, you know, the in, in this quarter we have a 3.5 in GDP growth. Would you say that um, the the transition from January to December budget uh, has sort of impacted significantly on our budget cycle? And don't you think that the Nigerian economy is quite resilient here? Well, the thing is that that, ex that extension of spend from uh, from J to January to January to March and to June is actually to beef for capital expenditure and create more jobs because that is really where the jobs lie, the opportunity to to you know energize the economy. So if you don't extend those, you would have written off the capital component of the budget and the opportunities to grow the economy would diminish. So I really think one part of the reason why we are. Plus, of course, the robust monetary policy intervention. That's why we are still keeping up with growth, even though we have extremely, extremely adverse um, uh, circumstances around all the other items of expenditure. Inflation is very, very high, and all of that. But this is this is very, very important that they continue to extend that that capital spend to, to put more pressure on growth. All right, Professor Kennedy, thank you very much. Now, let's, uh, of course, get into. Uh, budget proper for 2023. Uh, Professor Uche Waloke, what do you think? The numbers are out there. We have the number of assumptions. We also have projections. And of course, uh, the size of the budget, yeah. 20.5 trillion. trillion naira. Thank you very much, um, uh, Well, two quick submissions here. The first is to say that um, I think the benchmarks are realistic because I've, I've read some arguments, um, you know, saying that they are not. I think they are largely, uh, you know, are. If you take the oil price benchmark, for example, seventy dollars per barrel, um, and you consider the trend in the oil price, you consider projections by energy um, um, international energy agencies, um, you would come to the conclusion that seventy dollars per barrel is realistic. Record that we used seventy seventy three dollars last year. And uh, some people, you know, had said, why not we use 73 or something higher than 70? But of course, we also know that the international oil market is um, quite volatile. And um, when you're preparing a budget of this nature, uh, you know, amid the volatility, that there is need to be conservative um, and there is need to, you know, play safe. So $70 per barrel, in my view, is, um, is in order. The other um, aspect also has to do with the production, 1.69 million barrels per day. In my view, too, is um, um, realistic because last year we used 1.6. Yes, even though you, one could argue we've not been able to meet that target. But again, we know why. Unlike oil price, where we have little, where we have no control at all, uh, that of um, production 
to a large extent you know we have control once we know the upper quarter okay we should we should be able to meet that upper quarter um you know uh, running in for example uh, issues like oil theft and listening to the president in his but in the budget speech uh, he has said that the mmpc you know um, you know was doing something about the issue of uh, oil theft and pipeline vandalism so to that extent one would say the 1.69 million barrels per day you know is realistic if you take the exchange rate for example 435.57 okay it has already provided for the you know um, depreciation of the naira you know by uh, by next day but again I've, I've the um, some of the commentaries have also read you know uh, of the view that there should have been um the naira should have been further depreciated but again i don't think so um, because that will be saying that some of the efforts the central bank um you know uh, is currently making particularly with respect to the rt 200 uh, to bring in more dollars uh, in the economy next year you know will come to naught so i think all those we are taking into cognizance the issue of gdp growth rate 3.75 percent again if you look at project, the estimates by imf for world bank and and some others you know is not way you know to way uh, to, um, you know well ahead of those um projections uh, they're just within range okay but the only thing i see the two major risks i see to the uh, budgets you know 2023 budget uh, one the issue of the fact that there's an assumption that oil subsidy will go by july so oil subsidy will stay till june and then go by july so that assumption is what i i, I see as um, you know one of the challenges because the new administration may not summon summon the political will to remove that oil subsidy immediately it uh, is coming in because it may allow it may say it, you know it needs some time you know to settle down and that will of course mean that there will be a lot of off budget spending in 2023 arising from the subsidy itself and number two arising from the fact that two next year we are conducting election the conduct of that election particularly if it results a runoff may also lead us to you know some off budget uh, spending so for me these are the risks i see in that budget which is also why i think that of all the benchmarks uh, the inflation rate of 17.16 may not crystallize mm -hmm. um, and that's because once you remove subsidy in july it will automatically translate to you know higher domestic prices so inflation rate of 17.16 may it doesn't seem to me realistic on the basis of that assumption that's the first submission i'm making the other submission i'm making uh, by way of opening the statement too, is to say that one has noticed some positive reforms in the budgeting process in nigeria in a couple of years one of which is the fact that now finance bill usually sent alongside the the uh, appropriation bill which is fine the second thing is that the budget of the 66 government-owned enterprises now are integrated into the national budget so the 20.5 trillion you find contains about 2.4 2.42 trillion of government uh, um, enterprise um, spending unlike before when they were not you know part of that and the third positive thing i also see is that now the budget also tends to lean more towards non-oil revenue unlike previously if you look at the total revenue the government is expecting to get fg revenue about nine about nine trillion only uh, two trillion of uh, about two trillion of that is for oil the rest you know non-oil and of course finally very importantly the fact that again for some years now the appropriation bill has been submitted in good time relatively in good time okay um, we have seen what has happened in the past uh, you know before now when it you know it was usually usually submitted late and this is despite the fact that section 81 of the constitution allows the president to submit this appropriation bill anytime you know in the year before the next financial year so the president could have as well submitted it on 30th of december mm. but he has you know for some time now it's been been submitted in time you know allowing the national assembly enough time to interrogate the budget mm. so we need to sustain this tradition we need to entrench that tradition which is why you know i'm of the view that there's need for us to have a you know a budget law i have been saying it we need a budget law to ensure that these traditions are, are sustained mm. you know uh, such that we have in the law uh, the law will not specify the timelines for submission the fiscal responsibility act of 2007 section 11 only talks about the mtf 
uh, MTF being submitted four months. Okay. So it's silent on the, the budget. So right now, as we speak, our budgeting process is regulated by pieces of legislation. Oh. You know, you have uh, Section 81 of the Constitution, you have Section 59 of the Constitution, you have Section 11 of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and so on and so forth. But uh, Barrister Kinsel will agree with me that all this, we need a law, a budget law, you know, that specifies guidelines that, um, you know, addresses each of the four stages of the, you know, budgeting process. That's where we are sure that next administration will not come and then, you know, go back to the um, era of a late submission of budget with mm -hmm. all its attendant consequences. You know, fiscal uncertainties that sometimes, of most times, will result to uh, investors um, uh, pulling back lack of investors, you know, investment and confidence in the economy. Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, Professor Waleke, thank you. The issue you raised about uh, law is something that we can interrogate uh, subsequently. Because the appropriation uh, itself is, is a law. It's an act of, of the National Assembly. Yeah, budget law. So I, know, I know you're talking about process and yeah. procedure. Have the U.S. Congressional Law of 19 of U.S. Congressional Act of 1974, mm. something akin to that. A specific law. Yes, that regulates the budgetary process. So in that's, that's why I said that process yeah. and procedure. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Thanks, uh, Professor Michael Biden. Let's also have your take on, on some of the assumptions around uh, the appropriation bill for 2023. Uh, crude oil production 1.69. This year, we've been doing mainly, from some of the reports that I read, we've been doing less than 1.3 million barrels per day. Uh, when 2022 budget uh, was proposed, nobody knew that there was going to be some conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And suddenly, uh, the prices of oil, of crude oil, uh, have been way out of control, but we have also not been able to meet our quota. But let's have your take, regardless, uh, Professor Michael Biden. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kinsley. Uh, well, permit me to first, uh, you know, say something briefly on the question posed uh, by Jumai to Professor Waleke concerning whether the budget calendar had uh, you know, an impact on the growth achieved in the first second quarters of this year. I would uh, hesitate to say yes because there are fundamental factors that drive growth and which actually resulted in the improved growth performance this year from 3.11% to 3.54%. And the good performance, relatively good performance, is due to both fiscal policy interventions and monetary policy interventions. It's true that uh, the extension of budget implementation in you know, to perhaps April, uh, or June, that's capital budget, that in itself is an aberration. Once we have a budget calendar, a budget year, January to June, ordinarily the government should be able to implement the capital project within that period. It's just that for quite some time now, they are not able to do that for one th thing or the other. Uh, secondly, the we must understand the nature, the circumstances in which the economy has been operating and in which the budget you know, has been formulated and implemented. Uh, the circumstance of crisis in the economy, two recessions within you know, eight years, and then aggravated or elevated uncertainties. These definitely inform you know, both the implementation, the formulation and implementation, you know, of the budget. Um, well, perhaps I'll find time later to say something on the title of the budget itself in relation to the economy. But meanwhile, on the issue of assumptions, which uh, uh, Kinsley expected me to say something about, I will say that generally, I agree with the submissions of 
you know, Professor Owaleke. You know, for me, the assumptions under the circumstances are generally realistic. The GDP growth rate of 3.75% is very much in line with recent trends, you know, of improved growth and then uh, indicating resilience of the economy in the uh, of the economy yes there are headwinds you know being signaled at the moment you know related to performance next year uh, perhaps if the re recession threats that are you know you know being mentioned now in the advance of global economies materialize the growth projection you know may be dampened you know significantly but otherwise you know uh, with continuation of interventions on the fiscal side and on the monetary side we may be able to achieve something near the projection which still shows resilience you know of the economy uh, oil production, you know, still suggests the target of 1.69 million barrels per day. Still suggests that the government will not be able to have a good handle on the phenomenon of vandalization of pipelines in the Niger Delta, oil theft, and other malfeasances. You know, to be able to achieve the even the OPEC quota, I think it's about 1.8 something million barrels per day. And so what needs to be done will be implement strategies and measures to you know, resolve the issue of oil theft very quickly, such that you know more revenue, naira revenue for government and foreign exchange to strengthen the external reserve position and the naira you know, will be obtained. In other words, a government must find a way to address this issue on a short-term basis. That's a major source of the crisis that is uh, that's unfolded for some time you know, in the economy. I know government recently appointed uh, you know, a firm in the Niger Delta to secure the pipelines and prevent oil theft. But if something more needs to be done, you know, it needs to be done. Uh, the issue of exchange rate, you know, assumption, 435 uh, Naira per dollar, is realistic. It's in line with current situation. I think as at uh, two weeks ago or even now, the exchange rate, you know, already stood at uh, about 435 or 30 something Naira, you know, per dollar. And it's in line with the empirical studies done by the Central Bank of Nigeria on the equilibrium value of the you know, Naira exchange rate. The empirical studies do not support the current behavior in the black market or parallel market. And I think finally, the oil price uh, you know, assumption is also you know, realistic. Given the current trends, in the futures oil market and also the fact that you know recently there were reports that you know OPEC plus countries are planning to reduce oil production by about two million barrels per day if such uh, measures are implemented it is very likely that even if uh, oil prices you know, decelerate in the global market as had happened in the last few weeks, then definitely it may not be lower than $70 you know, per barrel. So overall, you know, uh, Kinsley, I think the assumptions are generally realistic. You know, what needs to be done to make, you know, the projections achievable, then the country should do it. Thank you so much, Professor Robert. Let me join Professor Ken if... Uh, Professor Ken, with a quite a large, you know, you know, big size appropriations, but a chunk of these appropriations will be borrowed to service 
the budget deficit of 10.78 trillion naira. You know, when I'm, I'm talking about this because of circumstances that might crop up, you know, the, the COVID-19 was an indication of what happened and how the oil prices went down. The president in his speech while presenting the budget really, really, you know, had on the fact that non oil exports should be a huge contributing factor to the implementation of the 2023 budget. What is your assumptions there? Well, it's, 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 uh, in fact, let me even congratulate them for, for shifting back the, because you know before, the expected revenue has gone up a bit, a bit from what we had during the strategy paper going in. So it's now gone up to about 9.73 trillion. And then, of course, the the GOE revenue is also coming, so that that's that's helpful. But in, in terms of the delivery, and so I must also say that the inflation uh, target is actually very very touchy because we now have, if you look at the inflation, what is driving it is food, the truck basket index, and with this this um, uh, flood scale of the flood we are having, the in the flood will go away, but the food that have been destroyed will not go away. So we may have to uh, struggle. Uh, we will struggle. That's not the place to make. We will struggle on food supply. And then that would mean higher prices of, of food and a shortage of, of food. So inflation is still going to go up, I'm afraid. So it might go up quite, quite higher than the 17 that was uh, predicted. But back on the, on the issue of uh, the, the borrowing. Now, there isn't a, a great lot you can do about what is expected to be borrowed, except that the the projections on the revenue uh, of the production should be we uh, should be concerned about 1.69 we have the potential to go up to about 1.8 according to the cost for that don't forget that 300,000 barrels a day in that production is condensed so we really need to get on top of that issue as professor mike has mentioned we need to get on top of it because that is a real new coming in if it doesn't come in as much you're going to pull up more and then, of course, knowing that debt service is a priority, uh, as well as all the current expenditure are priorities, we're going to see far more difficulty if we don't focus, critically focus on that, uh, on, on that, removing that constraint that is, that is stopping the, the production. Excellent, extremely important. Of course, there's also the need for us to um, look at how, how else we can manage down the expenditure, because I don't know how quickly. The, the the report about consolidation of of the of these other MDAs to reduce cost and the lot of cost of governance because that also will also reduce the impact on the budget and of course you have the revenue mobilization and revenue uh, strategic revenue initiatives being uh, followed by the Ministry of Finance very very commendable we need to have more traction on that because again it's about raising the money that we can. Obviously, I've seen that the revenue to GDP has gone from 7% to 8% here. Yeah. It could go even higher. The target of interest is to go to 15% by 2025 in the next uh, three years. But we can't go higher. If it goes higher to about 9%, it also increases what we're getting in. And all those are within our reach, are within our control. Only price is not within our control. But the production and the, the cutting down on, on the sizes of the expenditure and then bringing, bringing in more, widening the tax net, the way it has been projected in the in the uh, strategic revenue initiative. All of those will simply contract our our, our exposure. Uh, because it's going to be very, very difficult. You know, with all these assumptions that we might uh, remove the, the subsidy by June, is is as possible. Well, like I say, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult because if you don't remove it, it is not the new administration that will take the initial risk of having the baptism of fire, of coming in uh, on that day wanting to remove subsidy. That's not, that's not going to work. They are going to be still free shire, as, as we have done over the last seven and a half years or, uh, in, in taking down the, the value. Of course, there are other ways. We can actually quietly raise the, value of the, the petrol price to 200 naira. Easy. You can do that to 200 naira. Surreptitiously go up a little bit, even if it is by 10%. That will also contract our our debt exposure, and then give more money uh, to uh, other. If MNPC can get more pooled, then they could send more money to CBN. They're supposed to be sending about three billion dollars every month. Now it's only about three hundred billion. 
where is he been expected to dispose 1.98 billion dollars every month to, to import? So you can see the imbalance. So if we can get more, the answer lies in pumping out more crude, whatever it does, because it's going to settle a lot of detention across the forex area, across the uh, revenue expenditure, across, you know, across everywhere. So I, I think that that's, that's that's how much it relates to to the to the borrowing. Okay, uh, Professor Curry, thank you there for uh, your pitch on uh, aspects of the appropriation bill now before the National Assembly. Shabu Idris, let's also have uh, you weigh in on the assumptions uh, and, of course, some comments that have been made uh, with a resort again to more borrowing still uh, to finance the 2023 appropriation. I think uh, fellow discussants have done uh, justice uh, on the subject matter of assumptions. Uh, I have some agreement and a bit of divergent uh, views on one or two issues. Number one, uh, I fundamentally feel uh, that inflation being budgeted as 17.5% is a bit, uh, if you like, utopian. As at today, if we were to just tinker with the basket of uh, items that we take, the, the National Bureau for uh, Statistics take in terms of arriving at uh, inflation, we realize that as of today, inflation is somewhere around 30, 35, or even in some instances, 40%. So 17% is a non-starter. I believe we should be realistic to, to, to say that inflation might be as high as 25 or 30%. Uh, issue of uh, GDP growth 3.5, 3.7 again to my mind is a bit uh, uh, it's, it's too positive optimistic kind of uh, the, the, the central bank is currently mopping up liquidity uh, the uh, CRL, the cash reserve ratio has been increased, about 7 trillion naira is being mopped off, uh, the interest rates have increased, uh, I'm a debtor, I've just received a note from my bank to see interest rate on my credit or my loan has increased, that is, uh, intends a little bit of contraction uh, to uh, business. What will that posit? Largely, there might be a bit of contraction. So, to assume, to be optimistic that uh, the economy could grow to about 3.7% uh, percent, uh, in the coming year, I think is a bit optimistic. Uh, we need to water down uh, that expectation. Uh, regarding the issue of crude oil production, uh, if we remember, virtually all of us in this panel today at one time or another, I did discuss the issue of crude oil production. When we were producing 2.2 million barrels per day, there was uh, years that we produced 2.5 million barrels per day. What went wrong? If you go back to the first question, Kingsley, that you asked all of us, uh, what were assumptions? Do we really interrogate the past budget? What went wrong? And what steps have we taken to close those gaps? I, I believe it is high time that uh, government should, and even in the assumption put, we have an open quota of 1.82 uh, uh, barrels per day, and we are going to be producing 1.3 uh, million barrels per day. It is, it's, it's a non-starter. So the point I'm making is, yes, you know, government has done this assumption, but the assumption appear to be a little suspect in quite a number of, uh, of, of instances. There are two or three you know, fundamental factors that international economies look at at every point in time, which our budget seldom mention. Poverty level. There is no assumption, no budget as to what do we do uh, on poverty level. Unemployment. What is our current unemployment? What do we hope to see next year? There is no assumption on that. Misery index. Every country measures the level of misery that the populace, you know, uh, bear. This government and this administration, and successive administration, not just uh, President Buhari's administration, will not be budgeting on this. And we should have assumption to guide our thoughts on these uh, three key issues that affect each and every.
every one of us, whether you are in position or you are a commoner as we are, I believe there is need for the budget office to begin to look at these three factors as part of annual budget assumption to be put in the appropriation uh, act. Let's go to the issue of borrowing. We have a country today that will be spending close to about 7 trillion naira as debt servicing. The same country is going to be spending over 8 trillion naira on recurrent expenditure. We have not seen an assumption or a target that the government puts for itself in terms of what we call value for money accounting to block the leakages to reduce cost of governance as uh, professor ken ife has said so that that way we have some level of savings to say from this savings we will be able to fund you know even the capital expenditure we have a budget that has a capital expenditure of five trillion naira budget services of uh, six trillion naira and recurrent expenditure of eight trillion naira is that fair a developing country like ours I believe the reverse should have been the case. Maybe our capital uh, expenditure should be somewhere around 9 trillion naira, not uh, 5 trillion naira. And the current expenditure should be 3 to 4 trillion naira, at most 5 trillion naira. We, we are borrowing to service loans. We are borrowing to pay salaries. We are borrowing to incur recurrent expenditure, consumption. How do you borrow to fund consumption? This is an abnormality. In any economy, this is an abnormality. Yes, you know, the assumptions are there, but fundamentally, when you interrogate and you look at the budget, we have a serious problem in this country, and if care is not taken the next two, three years, things might ground to a halt because of this level of borrowing. Um, Shani Idris, uh, you've raised some pertinent questions, but I, I would like to come in here. The president in his budget presentation said that um, the borrowing, Nigerian borrowing, is within limits because still the government has been able to service debt. What's your take? Yes, um, Mr. President, this say the uh, budget is within limit, but uh, Jumai, which of the limits? There are about two, three limits uh, as far as uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act has put. And one of those limits, the president did admit that, you know, they are over and above, you know, what the, uh, the, the, the Fiscal Responsibility Act uh, provided. Uh, no two way about it. Number one, Jumai, our revenue to GDP ratio is below the reasonable Africa, even African benchmark, not even uh, international benchmark. We are still at five, six percent when international is about sixteen percent. Uh, budget, uh, you know, debt to GDP is somewhere around thirty six, thirty seven percent. We are about uh, getting to the minimum threshold of forty percent. You know, and a factor like I did say, the president did agree that these are over and above the limit. And he justified rightly that the situation we find ourselves made it, uh, you know, possible that we, uh, we, we go over and above that. But even then, how much are we doing to reduce cost of governance? If we can just tinker with our expenditure, this borrowing can appropriately be managed because we will be doing savings. Every one of us know if you are earning a salary of 200,000 naira, the day your salary comes down to 150 naira, wouldn't 150,000 naira, wouldn't you adjust? But this country is not adjusting. The, everybody and everything is just business as usual. There is no arm of government that is looking at where are we today? What do we need to do so that we sustain this country? But it's just business as usual. This is my concern. Idris, thank you very much for the comments that you have made. There are a number of matters, uh, gentlemen, arising from the contributions that uh, you have each made. Uh, we know the, the borrowing plant it's, it's one of them, and then the, uh, the aggregates for the critical uh, numbers. 
recurrent capital, and of course uh, debt, and then of course debt servicing. Uh, those are critical issues. But I, I think that I, I, I'm going to piggyback on one of the issues raised by uh, by Schreiber address, namely what appears uh, missing in the budget to say that. Yes, we have assumptions about uh, other aspects, crude oil production, the rate of inflation, the GDP growth, but we don't have indices relating to how the budget will help in knocking down poverty levels, in knocking down the misery uh, in index, and as well as in tackling unemployment. Which leads me to the question, beginning with you, Professor uh, Uche Waleke. Again, probably can tie it up to uh, review what went on in the past. To so say, is the appropriation designed ultimately to deliver the public goods? Or alternatively, is the appropriation delivering the public goods? Because out of the public goods, you will have an impact on the misery index, on the poverty index, and the unemployment index. Professor Wallach. Uh, thanks, Kinsley. Um, let me start by noting that <coughs> a budget is uh, nothing but um, a, a short-term planning instrument. Now, the budget uh, essentially derives from uh, the medium-term expenditure framework, you know, th three years. And the medium-term expenditure framework um, is usually a product of, the, of a national development plan. So, we have a national development plan. 2021 to 2025. And in that plan, I'm aware that you will find um, targets with respect to the number of Nigerians that will be lifted out of poverty. For example, it says that between 2021 and 2025, uh, the government expects to lift 21 million Nigerians you know, out of uh, poverty. Um, it also has the number of um, um, Nigerians. It, it, it also intends to um, uh, you know, lift or remove out of the unemployment term. Um, uh, 100 million. You know, 100 million is lift out of about, that's over a 10 year, yeah. over a 10 year period. Now, within that 10 year period, within that 10 year period, we have the medium one, which is uh, 2021 to 2025, that now says 21 million people are expected to be lifted out of poverty, you know, within that term period. So, what I'm saying is, these targets are there in the national plan, okay? And as I said, a, a budget is meant to be. The, a tool to operationalize you know, the national plan. It's a, it's a short term uh, plan. So they are there. And let us also note that um, <clears throat> there's a limit to which the budget speech we expect to find in you know, the president's budget speech. Even this one we saw, the president's speech we saw, you know, a 10 page um, you know, document. It's quite um, elaborate. I think he used that opportunity to talk about um, you know, what they have done in terms of. Um, uh, you know, funding infrastructure, what they intend to do in terms of also reducing prices. You know, for the first time, we had those, um, you know, imp imputes there. So, essentially, the it is the breakdown of the budget, of the of the budget speech okay. by the Minister of um, Finance and um, uh, that is expected to have the details of what the, uh, you know, the President has um, said. But permit me to also uh, weigh in on some of the, uh, the issue of um, borrowing, uh, which for me, is a major uh, my my major concern. Uh, you find that the the deficit is ten point seven trillion. Yeah. Out of that ten ten point seven trillion, the government says they want to do eight point eight new borrowing, eight point eight trillion new borrowing. The capital spend is five point three, five point um, you know three trillion. The capital component. So it means that we are borrowing. The borrowing is higher than the capital. What it means that close to three trillion of that borrowing will be go to is going to recurrent. So it's a major it's a major worry. And I also think that if we look at that appropriation bill, I've tried to go through it. Two hundred two thousand two hundred and eight pages. If you look at it, you, you you and you place it side by side with that of last year, we should be able to trim it down and reduce the size of that uh, the twenty point five. It can be reduced. Overhead alone is 1.1 trillion. Okay, I want to give you an example. If you look at the service wide votes, service wide vote alone has a al 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 allocation of over 3 trillion. Okay, you find that service wide vote in um, the budget of the Federal Ministry of Finance. Yes. And in that service wide vote, you find it has recurrence and capital. 
the recurrent has contingency of 30 billion. Contingency is what you provide for unforeseen, 30 billion. The same 30 billion we provided for contingency in 2022. The same. And you also find, apart from the contingency, you also have what they call margin for incre uh, increase in cost, um, uh, 12%. Mm. You go to capital, you have contingency of 15 billion. You have margin for uh, adjustment to capital expenditure of 19 billion. If you add all those um, contingency margin, you have over 70 billion. Yeah. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Science and Technology well, Professor, well, 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 has well, well, <laughs> was allocated 23 billion naira. Yeah. you know uh, by way of capital uh, uh, vote so i'm saying mm. that in that document we need to also look at allocation of resources okay. allocation of resources to to prioritize the developmental portion the capital portion as opposed to heaping money on overheads mm. heaping money on uh, areas that are also prone to corruption well indeed you raised a lot of pertinent questions here but you get to uh, our guests will have to get to respond to the question casely true and then when we come back after this break do stay nigerians elections are here again let us shun violence let us play the game according to the rules do not be a thug say no to violence let's rise and defeat violence crime and sabotage against the peace of our nation nigeria is the only country we have we must do everything to keep it united we must avoid any act that promotes hate and disintegration say no to separatist movement terrorism fake news hate speech religious bigotry and any act that tends to divide us as a nation watch out for strange gatherings and suspicious movements restrict access to sensitive documents and data the disclosure of which may damage national security educate your staff and family particularly on measures to safeguard information and report security breaches apply relevant legal security guidelines to protect yourself and your neighbor Due to misinformation and wrong choices, some idle persons resort to vices in their greed to get rich quick. They resort to kidnapping, killings for rituals, and other heinous crimes. Avoid wrong views of the social media before you broadcast that false message. Think twice. Ask whether it will promote peace or violence. For safety at home, still be security conscious. Educate your household on safety tips. Report all suspicious movements and persons to the security agencies nearest to you. Be a good citizen. Be patriotic. To pass security information, please call 0813-222-2105-0915-339-1309-0908-837-3514 or send a mail to dsspr at dss.gov.ng. This message is from the Department of State Services, DSS. Finally, the hero of Nigeria's democracy has arrived. He shall usher us into a new phase of development, peace, and prosperity. He is the father of the new Nigeria. Excellent. President Muhammad Bukha, TCFR. Welcome to another season of Giving Nigerians Hope Yet Again. We are sure of a great future for both ourselves and generations yet unborn. We look forward to your leading us as a nation into our manifest destiny. Though the challenges against us as a people are many, we know that your leadership shall set us on the right path to our greatness. A new dawn beckons on us all, and having you as our president is a precursor to this. Thank you for believing in Nigeria. This message is from the Nigerian Television Authority, NTA. We've been trying our best to contain the situation and in our operations uh, we've been able to make a lot of recoveries uh, we've been able to also arrest suspects that are involved in this kind of uh, activities and uh, we've been able to also recover particularly arms and ammunition uh, from those who are carrying it are lawfully and the uh, and the and the and the disturbing the peace of the people in but generally uh our morale in the Nigerian police is always guided by our commitment to do 
what we have sworn to do. Peace and security must be looked into as a priority by all. To look at security as the business of all of us. This message is from the Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. The Council of Our Fathers. I believe we have fought one civil war too many in this country. So those who experience it, we run away from it. Nigerian youths, let's build our nation together. Welcome back and it's still Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. All our four regular guests on economic and financial matters are still with us as we uh, commence the conversations around the 2023 appropriation bill of the federal government. Let's go over to our Benin Network Center and we join Professor Michael Bada. Professor Michael Bada, I still would like to ride on the question as to whether the appropriation bill can and may ultimately uh, help in delivering the public goods that will have a significant impact on the indices to which uh, tribal interests drew our attention, unemployment, misery, uh, and poverty. Uh, what, what is there in the budget that uh, could guarantee this, or what should the lawmakers now be looking at? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kisley. Uh, but let me first of all elaborate uh, very briefly on the very crucial point made by Mr. Shwebu Idris on the issue of the need for adjustment. You know, I tended to share that in using uh, adjustment in the past, but you know, now that he has mentioned it. But it's the issue actually that I had alluded to in my opening remarks that I will come back to. You know, you will see that the budget uh, presentation gives the impression that, it or tends to give the impression that things are normal. You know, in the economy, you just take some... Uh, rather palliative measures and then the situation you know will be much better but it is not so uh, there is a high level of economic crisis in the country and uh, manifested in you know through di different indicators you know uh, the fiscal deficit is uh, ballooning uh, public debt is uh, ballooning there is foreign exchange in a crisis in the economy, a situation which indicates that the economy is very far living beyond its means. And yet, we want to, you know, uh, worsen that situation through more and more borrowing, which is not advisable. And you will find that the budget is captioned fiscal in a budget of uh, fiscal consolidation and transition. You know, anyone that sees that one will, will expect something a little different from what has turned out to be the budget. You know, uh, fiscal consolidation, you know, normally in the economic balance refers to the situation whereby government implements policies and measures to reduce its fiscal deficit and debt accumulation. But you will find that you know the opposite you know, tends to be the case as portrayed you know, through the budget. In other words, there does not seem the budget does not seem to appreciate much that there is an economic crisis which has to be dealt with through strong reforms. You know that is to say, 
something like stabilization measures and uh, strong reforms, you know, to use a, light, a lighter language, or as Mr. Edry said, adjustment. What is needed, you know, the, we expect the budget at this point in time is to introduce such reforms, but with a human face, without adverse effect on social spending, for example. And then all other, you know, inessential, you know, public spending would be reduced in so that we have much lower recurrent expenditure, then you have much higher level of capital expenditure that can drive growth and yield the public goods which uh, Kisley, you know, rightly mentioned. And so, I would have ordinarily expected a situation whereby government consumption is reduced, you know, and focus on capital, you know, critical capital spending, infrastructure and all that one, you know, which the government has taken as a priority in the past years, you know, sustained. But this one is not the case. Rather, the budget is highly expansionary, which uh, if I had opportunity, would not have advised, you know, because of the expansionary nature of the budget and very low revenue mobilization capability, then the government is hoping to borrow much more, maybe about 8.8 .8 trillion and so on and so forth. That one will further compound the debt situation and you know similar kind of challenges and that leads me to the question of um you know the indication in the budget that in our debt position is within uh accepted or acceptable limits of 40 percent uh it, it, mr Idris analysis again is pertinent there is right you know, what I will always, I will always advise government to do a rethink of that position. That position of using debt to GDP ratio as a measure of debt sustainability or lack of challenges on the debt is not helpful. You know, it's misleading in the Nigerian situation. You cannot compare, you don't want to compare Nigeria with other countries that have much better indicators, high level of revenue mobilization, you know, high tax to GDP ratio, which they fall back on to service large amounts of debt. But like Mr. Idris says, those indicators are not in a really helpful in Nigerian situation. And so, what should be of importance to us in guiding future debt accumulation is what is our debt servicing capacity in terms of revenue. That is not, you know, uh, you know optimistic at this point in time. It's not uh, satisfactory, and uh, going forward, you know, it seems to have some challenges. So that in itself should caution, you know the country from further accumulation and now given the monetary policy normalization in uh, the many advanced countries and even the emerging and the uh, market economies interest rates are rising interest rates are rising on debt and so the cost of servicing becomes much more which means then that even on the present debt stock the cost of servicing next year you know, will be much higher if they were not on fixed you know, terms you know, initially. So what will they appeal to government to do a rethink of his position on debt? And then also, you know, can review the budget to initiate some adjustment measures related to government consumption. You know, the issue of cost of governance is part of this whole thing. So then on the question that uh, Kisley asked about uh, the delivery by the budget on uh, certain public goods like employment, you know, poverty, 
you know, are related social indicators. Um, I will say, yes, we are not able to say that one on the basis of the information that has come to the public space. That is the budget statement. Perhaps the budget breakdown, which is likely to follow soon, you know, by the Honorable Minister of Finance, is likely to give, you know, insights, you know, as to how unemployment, you know, will be reduced, and then poverty, you know, will also, also be reduced. But of course, the budget has been drawn up against the backdrop of the medium-term National Development Plan, 2021 to 2025. And that one has some details or strategies, you know, on how to reduce poverty, how to improve employment and hence unemployment, you know, and so on. Professor Obada, thank you so much for your input. Let's join Professor Ken. If uh, apart from the indicators, what was your take on the critical areas that you think the budget didn't really address and the call for the you know reduction in the cost of governance? Well, the, I connect this to the what uh, the bomb that um, uh, Shaibu has dropped, which is uh, how sustainable can we be in dealing with uh, poverty reduction. The only instrument being used for poverty reduction is the 500 billion social intervention fund every year, which has even gone down to 400 billion and see going down. But that, let me tell you, if you divide that money by minimum wage, it can only employ 1 million people. So there's no way you can, on the basis of that budget, at, at, you know, go for that target of 100 million people. So the question is, are we still going to continue to rely on anything but investments? In creating jobs, this traditional model about creating jobs is in flow of investment, whether domestic or foreign, to create economic activity, to generate jobs. Jobs generate disposable income. Disposable income pays for education, health, and poverty reduction in a sustainable cycle. That is what it should be. You don't want people to pay for and say you are going to reduce poverty. Now we are also now know that we have no escape from borrowing in debt finance, deficit finance. And we have now seen that the deficit financing has exceeded capital expenditure, which FRA in 2007 said you borrow to, uh, for capital purposes of a human resource development, which includes uh, employment, education, and health, and then other. But we are now going beyond that. So we have to deal with the configuration of the debt. We've seen that the debt service is 6.3 trillion higher than the capital expenditure. We've seen that the borrowing working point something trillion. Don't forget that from June to December, another 3.3 billion will, trillion will come from uh, the subsidy. So it is going to be effectively 11 trillion to be borrowed, and that is twice, more than twice the capital expenditure. So let's deal with the configuration of the debt. That's that's the real thing to deal with. Not harassing poverty by saying you juggle the job. That's nothing to juggle. We are harassing poverty. So what we should do? We are only going for debt um, uh, instruments, you know, for, for uh, it's, it's not this instrument what we use. The only thing that we have done on asset-based financing is the privatization proceed of 206 billion. And that is so small. So when, let's look at the big spanner in the works. Is the only NPC that has increased the, uh, the debt system by about 6 trillion. That the debt, and, but at the same time, it presents us with a good opportunity to move to capital asset based finance. If Saudi Arabia needed 26 billion, 25 billion dollars, and it's one of the biggest companies, uh, richest countries in the world, but it didn't go to borrow that money from any of the banks, the multilateral banks. Instead, they said, Tell me the value of Saudi Aramco. And when they found that the value was 1.5 trillion, he said, Well, really, just take it to the capital market and just sell 5%. Easy, and that was it. They got what they wanted. But that act of taking it to the capital market has increased the value in two years from 1.6 trillion to 2.3 trillion euro dollars. The most capitalized company in the world. So we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity right now with NMPC to which is at uh, the moment about 100 billion dollars. Just cap just take it to capital market within three to six years. And sell only 10%. And make sure you are selling it to the indigents, uh, the people in the United States, Nigeria, and say everywhere, the oil marketers, the unions, let people buy share and own this 
they this element feel that they are in yeah. and they will director come you must get the people to get involved so that they can now take this whole problem about uh, vandalization of our pipe people will deal with it because you know at the moment we are suffering because people don't feel that they own this company they have a share in it nobody knows and this is this is a national aspect that's not uh, uh, Professor Kenny, first, I'm sorry to uh, interject. We're getting pressed for time. Uh, well, first, we know that uh, going forward, we'll have uh, other opportunities uh, to interrogate aspects of the appropriation bill. But I, I just wanted uh, Shwaibu Idris to also weigh in on this. And I'm sure it's a matter that the other guests, uh, you know, will also have consideration on it going forward. We, we'll be talking about cost of governance. And then we have also seen the size of the recurrent budget for 2023 uh I, I did not appear to hear anything for instance other than to say look we're going to get out get rid of subsidy in june july next year nothing appears to have been said about the restructuring of the mdas on the basis of the orosa report where you have 600 plus mdas and these are some of the cost centers for the recurrent expenditure is this a lacuna that can be uh, taken care of Thank you uh, once again, Kisley. If you read the, uh, the the budget speech of Mr. President, uh, you will note that there was a paragraph there that he did mention uh, of the Steve Oroshenya report where he alluded to the fact that a certain portion of the report has been implemented, and one of which was uh, the issue of consolidation of uh, budget of the GOE, the government-owned companies with the federal government, and a number of uh, issues regarding personnel cost. But till now, the government has lacked the political will, the courage, and indeed the determination to implement, you know, that gospel uh, a report by Steve Orosenya and his team. And I believe it will be it will be good if Mr. President could please give us that as his parting gift. You know, the budget speech that Professor uh, uh, Uche Waleke alluded to the fact that was too long, you know, it was more like quote and unquote a benedictory speech by Mr. President because that is his last budget uh, speech to, uh, to the National Assembly. So he codified all the, uh, the project that uh, his administration has been able to implement in the last uh, eight years. And just on a lighter note, if you look at uh, uh, the day the president went in, all the three uh, key officers of government himself, the Senate president and the speaker, all wore white dresses as if they compared not before they, <laughs> they came on that day. So I, I believe uh, uh, generally uh, it would be good if uh, Mr. President could do this. And there was something I noted in that speech that was a bit of an abnormality. I think the, the author didn't do justice or didn't carefully look at it. The tax credit, in one portion of the tax credit, the road construction by some companies like the Dangote Group, the Boa, the LNG, it was one portion said 1,500 kilometers of road, and another section of it, they said 2,000 kilometers of road. So we don't know which one is which. Uh, Kinsley, fellow discussant, I believe you know, there is much to be done, and I do pray. I do pray most sincerely that the National Assembly will listen to some of this comment and be able to do justice in trying to approve this budget with a view to introducing an aspect of austerity measures that is long overdue to have been introduced in this system. Uh, mm. Mr. Shabu Idris, thank you so much for your you know, comment there and you know, on a lighter note, indeed I'm sure they must have thought that this is the last one, let's just go in white you know, and uh, go out in the blaze of glory like they say, thank you so much for your input on the program this morning, Managing Director and CEO Timeline Consult Limited he joined us from our Kaduna studio, also via Zoom we have joining us from Enugu, Professor Ken Ife, he's an economic policy analyst as usual it's a pleasure to have you join us on the program and um he, uh, from our business studio we were, we were joined by professor mike obado professor of economics and member cbm monetary policy committee 
Professor Uche Waleke, Professor of Capital Market at the Nasara State University, Kefi, and President Capital Market Academics in Nigeria. As always, it's a pleasure to have you join us to discuss and digest, you know, issues based on finance and budgetary affairs. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Jemai. Well, that is how it's been on Good Morning Nigeria for today, the first edition for the week. Thank you so much for joining us. Join us tomorrow for more. I am Jim Mike Yeso. And uh, happy Ide Malut uh, to all out there. Uh, tomorrow is another day, 7 o'clock, same time. I'm Kingsley Osadamo. <laughs>